Hey everybody, how's it going? Uh, welcome back to our memory class. We are tackling our third unit here. We're talking about the structure of memory. Now, a um, couple of things. One, this might be the longest video that we have all semester. Um, there's a lot to talk about. Two, I'm primarily going to be talking about one model of memory, which is the Atkinson and Schifrin model of memory, which is also referred to as the modal model of memory. But there are several others out there at least one that we're going to be reading about outside of class. Uh, and three, yes, I am having a bad hair day. Thank you for noticing. Uh, all right, but anyways, thank you so much for being here. Let's get into it because this is going to be one of the longer videos. If it feels like I'm breezing over something and you're a little bit unsure about it, feel free to email me and I'll be very happy to, to talk with you more about it. I, 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 will, I will write it up in an email. I won't be like, hey, you have to come by during office hours or whatever. Let's get into it. Uh, so, the outline for us today, I have a couple of videos uh, lined up for us here. Um, this one, the first one, is more kind of like a quick recap of some of the forgetting mechanisms uh, that we talked about last chapter. So when we are talking about transients and we were talking about interference, um, this video uh, talks about that. I'm not going to show it here, but in case you uh, want to check up on that, I think it's a good good way to get into this this chapter. We're going to be talking about the modern conceptualization of memory, and we're going to be talking, looking at a couple of classic examples, too. We're going to revisit Miller's magical number 7, plus or minus 2. Uh, and I, I love these other two videos here, because this one, uh, the one at the bottom, I'm going to show you in this presentation. So is a, is a, in case you wanted to check it out on your own outside of class, there's a link to it here. This other one, um, where I'm not, I don't think I'm really going to incorporate it into the video lecture, but I think that it's an interesting uh, video for anybody that's curious about individual differences in learning and things like that. Uh, this is uh, an example of what it's like to have auditory processing disorder. If you're not familiar with that, it's like an inability to kind of encode things auditorily uh, compared to visually. Long story, there's a lot to know there, but it'll come up, in, I'll, I'll bring it up in passing here, but we're not going to go into too much depth in this class about that. All right, so this is the modern conception of, conceptualization of memory. That basically we have three key pieces. We have the sensory memory, the short-term memory, and the long-term memory. There's a good chance that every single person in this class has heard of these two right here, short-term memory and long-term memory. There's a lot of misconceptions about that, which is one of the uh, things that we're going to be talking about today. Um, and I would say that um, most of what we've talked about this semester, when we're talking about Miller and the you know magical number seven plus or minus two, that was short-term memory stuff. When we were talking about the forgetting curve, that was long-term memory stuff. So we're going to be spending, and we're going to start by talking about what sensory memory is and when you might come across it in your everyday life. So before we get to that point, let's just take a quick, broad look at what this model is. Uh, this model um, has been around for a while, but you know has been kind of validated, you know, using neuroimaging and things like that. So this is a pretty good representation of how we remember things and the flow of that information as we are remembering it. Um, so the first piece that we have here is sensory input, and that can include anything and everything. Right now. My voice is part of that sensory input. The slides that you're looking at, part of your sensory input. How your clothes feel on your body, that's sensory input as well. Anything that is a sense is considered sensory input. It doesn't matter if you're aware of it or not. So for example, you may not be aware of the blouse that you're wearing or the way that your socks feel on your feet. You may not be thinking about that, so you're not aware of it. However, your body is still sensing it, you're just not really perceiving it to be there. And if you don't know the difference between what I mean by sensing and perceiving, you gotta come by my Psych 359 sensory sensation and perception class and we talk all about it in the first, uh, first chapter. Uh, so anything that you are sensing right now is part of the sensory input. That's gonna go into a very brief part of our central nervous system that we're gonna call the sensory memory. The sensory memory is very, very brief. But, and this is crucial, anything that you're not attending to is generally going to be lost and not relayed into short-term memory. This is why I was making such a big deal about how, like, uh, you may not think about how your clothes are fitting right now if you're not thinking about it, you, you know, you're not perceiving it until you have attention called to it. Um, 
most of that stuff, and in fact, I would say most of our experiences uh, are going to be unattended to. In other words, we're not paying them attention, and for that reason, they never make it into our short-term memory. They never make it into our waking consciousness. Uh, so from there, with the application of attention, it goes into short-term memory. And in short-term memory, very similarly, if we're not paying attention to something, if we are not rehearsing it or thinking about it, that information can be lost. But when it's in short-term memory, we have the ability to maintain it. We have the ability to be thinking about it. So if I gave you a complicated phone number, like 912 um, uh, I'm just going to say 1780. <laughs> I don't want to give you some exact phone number like I did uh, previously. Um, and if I asked you, like, hey, I'll give you $100,000 if you remember that number for an hour, uh, you'd probably be repeating it to yourself over and over and over, right? Uh, that is what we mean by maintenance rehearsal, where you're thinking about it, you're keeping it in your short-term memory. If you do a good enough job of that, if you make it important enough to you, if you make it relevant to your daily life, you've spent a lot of time attending to it, then you have a chance of encoding it into long-term memory. And from there, you can retrieve it over a very long period of time. Um, the limits of that, we're still kind of discovering every day. Uh, and then, if I were to ask you a year from now, hey, do you remember that number, that phone number I asked you to remember memorize? If you do, in fact, remember it, that would be an example of you retrieving that from long-term memory so that it is in your short-term memory where you're then thinking about it. Okay, let's talk a little bit about this specific model. It comes to us from the 1960s, um, and uh, it was really, um, sorry, let me, let me back up a little bit. Um, it was really, I would say like, it was introduced in the 60s, but really kind of caught the public's eye around the 70s when we started learning more things about short-term memory and differentiating that from long-term memory. And then in like the 80s and 90s, it kind of fell out of favor. And then um, with the, the promulgation of neuroimaging and other kinds of neuroscience techniques, you know, using fMRI and, and EEG and things like that, people basically began to realize like, oh no, like this model, this old very simplistic model does account for a lot of our memory. Uh, so here I have um, a, a couple of things I want to point out. Um, that these things that we're talking about, you can see we're going to be spending a lot of time throughout the semester on various parts of this. So this week we're going to be talking about models of memory. So we're going to be talking about short. Right, we're going to be talking about all of these, but I'm going to be spending special attention talking about sensory memory because it doesn't come up as much in the in the previous in the later units. Um, but uh, in the coming weeks we're going to be looking at explicit memory. Uh, we're going to be looking at implicit memory, both of which are examples of long-term memory. We're also going to be looking at working memory, which is generally considered, you know, what we mean by short-term memory. We're actually referring to working memory. So we'll talk about that and, and the different components of that um, in that unit. Uh, then where do we go? From there, we're going to be talking about classical conditioning and how we learn associations uh, with things in our environment. And that is also long-term memory. After that, we're going to be talking about neuroplasticity. So how the brain um, is able to rewire itself, that is going to be a long-term uh, memory um, question. And then we'll be talking about expertise. And expertise is a interesting kind of mix of long-term memory and sensory memory. Um, we'll be talking about false memories, False memories is kind of a collaboration of short-term and long-term memories. Uh, we'll be talking about emotion and memory. That's usually, I would say, more long-term, but there's also some short-term stuff. So we're going to be all over the place here. We're going to be kind of like bouncing back and forth here, kind of exploring each of these units. So even though um, we're going to kind of talk about each of them, there's so much to know about each of these different models um, or each of these different kind of pieces of our memory. Okay, so I want to just kind of give us a quick piece of context for where this model came from. And I mentioned it was from 1968. If you're thinking about the history, you know, George Miller hit the scene in 1956 with the magical number 7, plus or minus 2. So before that, you know, so before the 60s and in and, and the early parts of the, the 50s, when we started talking about memory, it was very different than how we think about it now. Uh, and I even noticed this in some of your discussions uh, when you're talking about George Miller. Um, some people were pointing out how, how differently he talks about it then compared to how we talk about it now. Like We don't talk about bits, really, when we're talking about, uh, about memory. Um, and part of the reason that 
we just have a very good vocabulary for this stuff is because most of psychology and psychological research was kind of of two minds. The first is behavioral uh, component. If you've taken cognitive psychology, you you may have heard me talking about that at the, you know, the beginning of the semester I talk about behaviorism. If you've taken learning or if you've taken applied behavior analysis, those are very much kind of like parts of the the, the field of psychology that are indebted to behaviorism. So and behaviorism is all about classical conditioning and operant conditioning and how we can talk about how behavior changes as a function of the consequences and the environment around us. So that's behaviorism. Think of, you know, B.F. Skinner, John Watson, the Baby Albert studies, Pavlov's dogs, those kinds of ideas. Those are all kind of behaviorist. Um, so they would talk about memory maybe more in context of learning associations and things like that. A lot of times with aversive conditioning. So if you were to eat a really bad food, how long would you go on avoiding it? Um, that would be an example of a long-term memory question. Uh, the other side of things were, uh, were a little wacky because they were psychodynamic, which means that they were more kind of indebted to Freud. Um, and here, uh, the, instead of thinking about how behavior sh is shaped by our contacts and about the consequences of our actions, psycho psychodynamic theory is basically that our behavior is kind of a competing conflict between our conscious and unconscious forces. I think y'all probably know where I stand on this. I think a lot of that stuff is just a bunch of malarkey and it does, you know, is, is, doesn't hold up to research or science uh, in a meaningful way. Um, and so both of these fields uh, by the, I would say by the late 60s, we're already starting to kind of take a backseat to other uh, areas of psychology, like cognitive psychology or social psychology, um, or even in specialized developmental psychology and things like clinical psychology. Um, all right, uh, so today we see things very differently. We talk about memory very differently than either of these ways uh, because of, of George Miller and then before that because of Ebbinghaus, right? We talked about Ebbinghaus back in the previous unit when we were talking about the forgetting curve, but a lot of his stuff wasn't really kind of like integrated into the larger framework of psychology until the 60s and 70s. Um, all right, so just a quick review of George Miller. Uh, uh, back in the in the mid to late 50s, George Miller talked about how we have a, a, a capacity for our memory. And one of the things that y'all brought up in your discussion, some people were like, hey, wait a second, uh, I can remember more than seven things, right? So you can remember maybe, you know, more than seven days of your life, maybe, you know? So what does George Miller have to say about that? I think what we see now is that what George Miller is referring to here, all of this is short-term memory that that is what we think of it as short term now, that it's something that is in your consciousness and then if you're not paying attention to it, it can leave us and then you forget it, right? Uh, and so his assertion and what he kind of showed using a lot of other people's data is that generally speaking, the human capacity is about seven items, seven discrete items, which means that if I'm trying to remember a phone number, then I would do a good job of remembering about seven of those items. For some of us, it's actually gonna be closer to five items, and then for some of us, it's about nine items. For me, whenever I've tested it, it's about seven right on the, right on the dot. So I'm not special, unfortunately. Um, so that means that we can remember about seven items, uh, and that wiggle room, the plus or minus two, is just because we all have these individual differences. But there is some really interesting um, uh, things to think about here. For example, if you remember a phone number, a phone number has more than seven numbers. How are we able to remember a 10-digit phone number? You may remember that I talked about that we chunk it, basically. So if I said 912-739, um, I think I said 1780 was what I said earlier. Uh, I don't say 912-739-1780, and neither would you if you were repeating your phone number. You're going to chunk it into these three discrete or four discrete pieces, right? So that way it fits comfortably in our short-term memory. Here I was going to try something where uh, when I was coming up with my notes where I tried to blank the screen, but um, this is not my first time trying to record this. The first time I tried to record this, I quickly realized I can't really blank the screen in a meaningful way here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you these words and I want to see how well you can remember them. So if I were to ask you, plain, fling, rise, young, fur, lung, reach. I'll say that one more time.
plain, fling, rise, young, fur, lung, reach. If I were to then take that away and ask you to count backwards from 10, for example, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Now do your best to try to remember what those words were. And you can pause this video if you want to to try to remember that. Um, there's a good chance that you're going to, some of you may remember all of those words, but I'm willing to bet that probably most of you only remembered about four or five of them, right? Uh, with practice, we can get up to seven, you know, so if I gave you these other ones, then we could kind of test that out. But the point is that there is a limit to that, and it's not always seven. Sometimes it's five, sometimes it's even less than five. We'll be talking about why is it not always perfect like that. Um, and if you want to test your memory on these other ones, then you can try this too. But one of the really fascinating things is that, actually, let, just indulge me for a second. You tried this, this first one, and then you can think about how many you got. Five, six, four, however many. I'm going to test you one more time, and I want you to do your best. Um, or give it 75%. You'll have to go 100%, you know you got important things going on if your mom calls you during the middle of this feel free to answer the phone you don't have to make it you know life or death situation all right i'm going to read these out loud let's see how well you remember these autonomy motorcycle curriculum philosophy simplicity authority coalition i'll say it one more time autonomy motorcycle curriculum philosophy simplicity authority coalition okay Good count down from 10 again. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. That's how we how count much hide and seek. Or how little are we actually aware Sorry. of? <laughs> we decided Sorry, to read one of Simon's most famous. I accidentally st I, I touched my ear, and because of technology, it started the previous video. That was not a setup. That was not me trying to distract you. <laughs> my bad. Now, do your best to remember those seven words. Pause the video if you feel like it. I'm willing to bet, and I would put money on this, that you were not able to remember all seven of those. And furthermore, I bet that you weren't able to remember as many as you did of the first line. And the reason for that, what is the difference between these? These are all one-syllable words. These are all one, two, three, four, four. Yeah, these are all four-syllable words. I had to count. I had to sound them out to make sure that was right. Uh, so why is it that we remembered more of these and less of these? it actually does have them something to do with how many syllables are in each of these words. Why is that? Might be because George Miller was kind of right again. Maybe it's not that we remember seven words, maybe it's that we remember seven syllables, right? Maybe there's an alternate explanation. Let's take a look. This is referred to as something called pronunciation time. One thing that we find, and this is after George Miller's time, you know, so like, think of the magical number seven as a nice guideline is not always going to be true there's going to be lots of exceptions to that this is one of those exceptions that the length of time it takes for you to pronounce something can also change your ability to remember things and what this uh, research team in the 80s found is that if you're working with words that take longer to sound out that your memory for those that list of words is going to be shorter than if you are remembering a list of words that you can pronounce very quickly. They even went through and controlled for familiarization of the words, complexity of the words, to make sure that, you know, it's not like, oh, well, the first list was easier words and the, and the longer list was more difficult words. Even when you control for that, it this seems to hold true, that really what is a limiting factor on our short-term memory is how long it takes to pronounce these things. How we think about that now is that that means that we have a capacity in our short-term memory that is limited not just by amount, not just seven things, but by a time limit. That we can only rehearse things in a loop that lasts about one and a half seconds, maybe two seconds that as long as you can repeat those words within two seconds, you can remember them very reliably. Just like with a phone number, you know? If you're trying to remember a phone number, you're not gonna remember it very slowly. You're gonna rehearse it yourself, 912-334-1280, uh, uh, 12, uh, or whatever. I think I, I gave you the wrong number, my bad. Um, and this is true if you're pronouncing it out loud or sub-vocally, so if you're, even if you're saying it to yourself. 
But here's the really fun thing that George Miller, the reason why I'm saying that George Miller was kind of right about this, is that for an English, most of the time, most of the time that it takes for us to say seven numbers is about one and a half seconds. So that's how long it takes for us to articulate that, to say it out loud. Um, sometimes you'll hear this in the literature called the word length effect. The thing that I love about this though, because if you're looking at this and you're still a little bit skeptical, maybe the next figure will convince you otherwise, because because hey, I'm referring to English here, right? What if we were to look at digits in a different language? Well, a group of researchers did do that. They did the same task, but this time they did it across four different languages. And so they did it in English, in Spanish, in Hebrew, and Arabic. And uh, essentially in those languages, English, a lot of those are monosyllabic. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Seven is two syllables. But uh, compared to Spanish, right, where uno, that's, that's two syllables. Uh, cuatro, that's, that's two syllables, so depending on if you're counting the rolling R uh, as a syllable in and of itself. Um, and so you can see that like, hey, English folks are able to remember um, were, like, uh, uh, these numbers um, a little bit better than if, they, if the same people who speak both English and Spanish, the same people that just whenever they switch languages have a little bit of a drop here because those English words are pronounced a little bit easy, a little bit faster. Whenever those words are longer, the numbers are longer to sound out, to pronounce, our memory for those gets a little bit worse because it's harder to cram those into that one and a half to two second loop of memory. And, and as I'm saying this stuff out loud, it makes it sound like I'm saying like, hey, if you're an English speaker, that's better. That's not what I'm saying at all. I'm just saying that because the, the, the number system in English has so many monosyllabic uh, um, uh, words, it's efficient for the brain to encode them uh, in that short time span. All right, so this brings us to, well, exactly how long is memory then? There's a lot of debate about this. So for, for long-term memory, people will say, okay, if it's longer than 30 minutes, if you can remember something that happened to you an hour ago or 30 minutes ago, then we're gonna consider that long-term memory. Fine, whatever. Uh, some people say that it has to be, you know, after a night's sleep. If after a night's sleep you still remember, then it's long-term memory. I'm not going to force you to try to obey one of those definitions because there is disagreement about it in the field depending on how we define long-term memory. Short-term memory, there is more agreement with short-term memory. Most people say short-term memory is about 90 seconds. Well, some people say 30 seconds to about two minutes. Most people don't say longer than two minutes though. So anything that you can remember within the time span of about two minutes, that's gonna be short-term memory. But this is why this is so frustrating is because there is a big difference between two minutes and 30 minutes. So in that time frame, well, what, what kind of memory is that? If it's not short term and long term, is that medium term memory? This is one of the, like, it's, that's the frustrating thing about whenever people start trying to research this stuff is that you have to pay really close attention to how they are defining short term memory or how are they defining long term memory. Pay very close note to that in the reading that we have for this week. Um, or for this unit, uh, you'll see what I mean um, about whether or not you agree with their definitions of short-term or long-term memory. Um, the distinctions are partly fuzzy because we're using a combination of both of these things, and I think that most memory researchers would say that between long-term and short-term memory in this time span, we're using a little bit of both. And because we're using a little bit of both, it's not we can't reliably say it's just short-term or that it's just long-term. So let's take a quick look back at this 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 broad overview and what we're going to do now from basically now until the end of the chapter is kind of do uh, an exploration of each of these things what are their characteristics when are they being used what kind of things can you store there so these are the three levels of storage sensory short term and long term and we're going to think about this in many cases like a what they call the information processing model uh, which is that we have encoding as the first step uh, and we'll talk, we're going to talk a lot about this this semester. We're going to use this language over and over and over. And so I'm bringing it up now, but I'll talk about it in much more detail later this semester. That we have these three pieces. We have encoding, storage, and retrieval. Encoding is taking it in, taking that information in, 
storage is maintaining that information, and retrieval is, as it sounds, accessing that memory from uh, from storage. So um, the th levels of storage then are going to be uh, uh, sensory short term and long term. So that's kind of what we're looking at right here. It's just this piece right here. And in future units, we'll be talking about encoding or retrieval more specifically, though. OK. And I already mentioned this piece here about how like this model kind of went out of fashion in the in the 80s and 90s and kind of made a comeback whenever people started um, studying the brain uh, using neuroimaging to kind of validate some of these findings. All right, so let's get into it. So here is a, a, a more kind of nuanced, um, uh, complex view of sensory memory, short-term memory, and long-term memory. So sensory memory, the three ones that we're going to be talking about are visual, auditory, and haptic. We can assume that there's also sensory memory for olfaction, for taste, and uh, for vestibulation, um, the other senses that we have. It's just that they are much less studied uh, compared to these other ones. Um, and actually, some of the research that I do, um, like the, the re when I'm not doing research with students, like my, my personal stuff that I, that I am interested in, are these less known senses, specifically taste, um, and, and how, we, how we encode them as, as memories. So let's say that we pay attention to our senses. That is going to get into short-term memory. And from there, that's where we have rehearsal, so our ability to rehearse these things to ourselves, uh, our ability to code things. What does that mean? Imagine like if you were to feel like you close your eyes and you feel something on the table and you think to yourself, oh, that's my iPhone charger. That's an example of taking a haptic experience that's derived from touch and coding it into a verbal label. Uh, this is where we can also think about what kind of retrieval strategies we make and, and how we decide what to do with information. From there, if we're rehearsing all this stuff, if we're doing a good job maintaining it, it can make it over into long-term memory. All right, so where is memory? I mentioned that this model had kind of fallen out of favor until neuroimaging kind of saved it uh, from obscurity. Uh, well, obscurity is a little, that's a little dramatic. It wasn't like that. It was, it's not like it was, you know, people had forgotten all about it. It was just like, there were some models that were proposed in the 90s that were really kind of catching steam until they were harder to validate with, with neuroimaging. We'll talk about one of the a couple of those that I'm really fond of actually uh, in the working memory chapter. So make a mental bookmark when we talk about Nelson Cowan. When we talk about Randy Engel, uh, that's what I'm referring to in the 90s. Uh, all right. So where are these things in memory? It's not that easily mapped onto our brain. Um, however, think about sensory memory not as having is not one unit in our brain. Sensory memory is spread out across the cortex. It's spread out in the areas of the brain that are specialized in the perception of those senses. So for example, um, the, your sensory memory for visual information is going to be taking place here in the occipital lobe in the visual cortex. If you are remembering something and your sensory memory is auditory, then we're going to have a lot of that in this region right here in the temporal lobe, specifically if it's not just sound, but speech. Um, if we're thinking about how things feel, that's going to be taking place up here in the parietal lobe, specifically around the, the somatosensory cortex. Um, yeah, and those are the three big ones, right? And But if we wanted to be more specific, we could say that like the olfactory buffer, uh, the olfactory sensory system, is going to be somewhere, I would say, probably over here in the OFC, um, in the orbital frontal cortex. Uh, if we're talking about taste, that's probably going to be more in the insular cortex, which is around here. Well, hold on. Actually, more right around here. Um, yeah, and those are the big ones, right? Those are, those are the big five. Um, if we want to talk about short-term memory, though, short-term memory is almost exclusively this piece right here, the prefrontal cortex. Um, specifically, actually, the you're not going to need to know this yet, what they call the VMPFC and the DLPFC, which is the ventral medial prefrontal cortex and the dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex. All the time, you do any kind of short-term memory task in, uh, you know, in neuroimaging, you're going to have one of those two areas activated depending on the task you're doing. Um, 
And then we have long-term memory. And long-term memory is free-for-all. Like, long-term memory could be distributed almost anywhere throughout the cortex. We're going to see that a lot of it is going to be, um, is going to activate the hippocampus, maybe, but the hippocampus, excuse me, the hippocampus isn't exactly where things are stored. The hippocampus is going to help us consolidate memories. We'll talk a lot about that in the implicit memory unit uh, when we talk about uh, amnesia specifically. Um, all right, so long-term memory is just kind of throughout the, the whole brain. All right, so let's talk about sensory memory. Um, oh, and I didn't mention, I'm trying to change up the color scheme uh, as, the, as the, the, the semester goes on, just to kind of keep it interesting. So here I have it, orange. Um, and I don't know, I'm not, I'm not really, I like orange. I graduated from Auburn University, right? And you know, like they love orange there. All my Auburn shirts are orange. Uh, but I don't like this orange. I don't know, it's kind of weak. Um, and it kind of makes this yellow cursor look green, which is really interesting. Can anybody in my sensation perception class tell me why? I can't give you extra credit because it would be unfair, but I would love <laughs> for you to say, here's why. And it has to do with the third step of color processing, uh, but we don't have time to talk about that. Uh, all right, let's talk about uh, our sensory memory. Sensory memory, think of this as the first, it's the gateway, it's the, it's the, the gatekeeper between what you sense and your conscious waking memory. So if you are paying attention to the way something feels, then you're allowing that information to get to your short-term memory effectively. Um, if I ask you to think about any noises you hear around you, then what I'm asking you to do is to allow some of that auditory information that you're attending to it so that it can get to short-term memory and you can think about it and you can rehearse it and you can make decisions about it. Um, so this is the first piece. This is, you know, kind of where we start bringing in, this is kind of the beginning of memory uh, of our journey here. Um, a couple of things to know though is that it has a huge capacity and a very, very brief duration. And if you talk to people who do, who do research in this stuff, it's so funny how like, this is such a mantra or a model that everybody talks about sensory memory like this, where they say capacity is limitless, duration is brief, or capacity is robust, duration is brief. It's always the same thing. Um, basically what we mean here is that if I ask you to focus on a part of your body, if I ask you to focus on your shoulder, you're able to give your shoulder all that attention and you can you can think about all that stuff on your shoulder while your while your attention is cast upon it because your memory for the sensory stuff is fantastic it's really really good very very robust visually the same thing anything in your visual field could count for your sensory memory so that includes everything here and in that regard sensory memory has a larger capacity than short-term memory. I'm gonna say that twice more because it is such a hugely important thing. Sensory memory has a larger capacity than short-term memory. Sensory memory has an even bigger capacity than short-term memory. Is it bigger than long-term memory? It really depends on who you ask. Some people are very stubborn and say long-term memory is, is, is limitless and there is no limit to it. And if that's the case, then sensory memory is not as big as as, as long term, I would say it's okay to 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 say that sensory memory comes second in terms of in terms of its capacity. But here's the kicker: that capacity is great. However, it's extremely short. It is extremely extremely brief. And when I say extremely brief, I mean less than 200 milliseconds. Effectively, we're talking a fraction of a second. That's how short this memory is. Um, so if I ask you to focus on a part of your body like your shoulder and then you stop thinking about it, within 200 milliseconds there could be a change here and if you're not attending to it, you may not even recognize it. Um, all right, so um, what sensory, let me erase that so it's easy to, easier for you to see. Uh, what this is, what sensory memory is, 
is really just the ongoing activation from different parts of your sensory system that have been activated uh, because we are perceiving them, or because we're sensing them, I should say, sorry, because we're sensing them. So that's why when we go back to look at the brain, that's why these areas associated with vision uh, are active during the sensory memory portion is because that memory is made up of the lingering activation that's left over from perceiving those things, from sen sorry, from sensing those things. I would be so disappointed with myself. You can tell that I'm not teaching sensation perception this semester, right? Because I'm, uh, 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 um, I'm using those words interchangeably whenever that's a big no-no uh, in that class. Um, so this is why visual information, visual, visual sensory memory is going to happen in the visual cortex in the occipital lobe. This is why auditory memory is going to be in the temporal lobe and why touch memory is going to be in the somatosensory cortex and so on and so forth. If we want to break it down further, there have been a lot of studies to look at both vision and hearing sensory memories. Visual sensory memory is called iconic uh, uh, sensory memory. Um, for hearing, it is echoic sensory memory. So iconic memory um, is is like that really, really brief snapshot of your memory, of your visual memory, was everything in your visual field that lasts for a, a split second. To give you an idea of what I mean by that would be like, um, I gotta tread light, I gotta be careful here because this, this example is a little bit tricky. I keep talking about sensation perception. But if you're familiar with color after images, where like you're looking at a dot on a screen and that dot goes away and you still feel like you see it there, that can be an, an, an example of a sensory memory because that's from ongoing activation in your cortex um, that shows that you still have information in that part of your visual field even if it's not actually there, which is the definition of memory, right? Holding on to piece of information when it's not directly presented in front of us, that is memory. Um, so that's iconic memory, echoic memory, uh, that's the same thing but for auditory uh, information. Um, but you know, basically the same thing. Now theoretically we would also have uh, cool definition, you know, or bolded terms for taste memory and olfactory memory, but they just haven't been studied nearly as much and so they just don't have these catchy words for those. Um, all right, so I want to show you a very quick kind of replication of how we know about sensory memory. This comes from Sperling's lab in 1960, so this is forever ago, um, just shortly after George Miller though, right? But this is 1960, so it was before the atkinson Schifrin model was made uh, form formal. Um, so this task, I'm going to show it to you real quick. Let's see where, here we go. Um, where, oh, did I not, okay, sorry, one second. Did it, oh, it didn't do anything, come on. Why is it embarrassing me? There we go, okay. Um, I'm going to mute this for a second. But basically what you're supposed to do in this task is you, you would either hear a high tone, a mid tone, or a low tone like that and you're supposed to look at this fixation cue you hear the low tone and it's going to show you sorry I'll let, I'll, I'll let this talk for a second okay so now you have an idea for the the low middle and high tones what Sperling did is he essentially is going to say if you hear a high tone I want you to recall all the numbers on the top row if you hear a medium tone I want you to recall all the letters in the middle row if you hear a low tone I want you to recall all the letters on the bottom row so here we go Okay, so here are the answers, I, E, and, oops, sorry, I, E, and A. You may not have 100% on this, and that's okay. But what's really interesting about this, and what he would go on to show, is that whenever you have this happen, and you hear that low tone immediately after it's presented, so it was a blank screen whenever you heard that tone, 
you heard the low tone, and you immediately thought about I, E, and A. You thought, what were those letters? And maybe they flashed in front of you. If they did, that was that sensory memory going into short-term memory so that you could recall it. Now, if you did that same thing, you would not be able to remember the top or middle layers um, because they fall outside of that 200 millisecond duration and then they're gone. They're, you, you did not attend to them and so they're gone. I'll give you one more example. I'll let this play through. All right, so try to think about what that top row was, right? And then there you go. If you did good on this and you successfully remember this top row, it was at the cost of these others because you were not attending to them and so you would have uh, lost it. So that's, that's uh, Sperling's whole thing, uh, George Sperling, who did this stuff. Um, classic research article, too boring for me to assign to you though. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's okay. Sperling is not going to watch this. He's not going to watch YouTube. Uh, or at least I hope he... Yeah, he's not going to. Uh, but, uh, so that's that's kind of one of the early studies that helped us understand there's something about this iconic memory, about this visual memory for things that happen in the blink of an eye. Okay, so let's move on to short-term memory. But you know, keep in mind this, the sensory memory stuff. Actually, I'm going to show I'm going to show you something real quick. I'm going to show you one more video, and this is going to be kind of a bridge between short-term memory and long-term memory. Um, or sorry, sensory memory and short-term memory. Uh, this comes from a uh, a PBS special about memory, and they're going to replicate a very famous um, study. Which if you if you've taken cognitive psych with me, I've shown it here. I've shown it there before. Um, but uh, yeah, here we go. I want you to think what's going on in their memory as you see this happen. In this experiments to see for ourselves, here's the setup. Our senior series producer, Vin, poses as a lost pedestrian and asks a passerby for directions. Excuse me, I'm looking for the skyline. Then we break the two up, walking through them holding a large sheet of wood. Now watch as I replace Vin. You might think people would notice the switch, but Almost half the time, they didn't. Of course, that means more than half the time they did. We only tried the experiment nine times, and by no means was it good science. But we were surprised four people didn't notice the switch. In Simon's original experiment, seven out of 15 people didn't either. So what determines whether or not you can figure out the switch? When you look at another Okay, so in case you didn't see what was going on here, and that was this guy over here. This is the original research. Oh, that's a really intense look. This is the original researcher, Daniel Simons, uh, up at Harvard, who did this back in the 90s. Um, so uh, uh, here, basically, I love this one because the guy realizes it and then immediately walks away. <laughs> that basically what they're doing is that they are talking, and then they are interrupting, and then they are replacing, right? And so here... This is an example of kind of, I'm going to say sensory memory, but if you want to say the short-term memory, there's some flexibility, there's a fuzzy distinction here, but let's, let's look at what's happening. He's looking at this guy, right? If this guy were to immediately change into somebody else, he would notice it, right? If you're looking at somebody and then right before your eyes they turn into someone else, you would absolutely notice it 100% of the time. However, when your visual field is disrupted, even for a split second, this happens. Well, sorry, this is a bad example because he does recognize it. But the others, they didn't recognize when these gentlemen changed. And, you know, this guy's wearing pants, this guy's wearing shorts, this guy's got a black ball cap, this guy's got a blue ball cap. There's plenty there to notice the difference, right? Um, if you don't notice the difference here, then what we would say is that that sensory memory, that iconic memory, um, uh, you lost it whenever it was very briefly interrupted by these people walking by. It left your sensory memory so that you couldn't make an accurate comparison with your short-term memory later on. This guy, though, he was able to recognize the difference. So we could say that he may have 
you know, he may have been looking at his face and had thought about his face whenever they cut across and interrupted him, and then he was able to think about it in a short-term memory and make that comparison with his incoming visual information, visual memory, and say like, wait a second, this is a different guy altogether. All right, so that is uh, 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 sensory memory. Let's move on to short-term slash working memory. So this is what George Miller was talking about. This intermediary step between sensory memory and long-term memory this is going to handle um, incoming experiences that we have that are happening right in the moment and our ability to recall them from previously. So if you're eating oatmeal and it's bad oatmeal, um, that's a sensory memory happening right now. And then whenever you see it again, you see oatmeal and you're like, no, I don't want that. That's an example of your long-term memory being accessed by your short-term memory. So information that we have in our short-term memory, we can attend to it. We can rehearse it. We can, uh, as some researchers say, we can manipulate it in our mind. If you were to think, for example, about um, this, uh, this thing of coffee, uh, I'm going to say coffee, of water. And if I were to ask you to mentally rotate it 180 degrees to imagine what it looks like from the back, you can do that. And you can do that in your short-term memory. You can do that, or if you're trying to remember a list of words and then I ask you to recall them in reverse order, that's also kind of manipulating that information in your short-term memory. This is about seven items plus or minus two. Um, however, uh, more recent research suggests that it's actually smaller than that. Uh, Luck and Vogel, um, back in the 90s, Stephen Luck uh, uh, had this, and this was, they were using complex visual objects here instead of words, found that our capacity for such things are really closer to about four plus or minus one. Um, Cowan would say it might even be around three. Uh, so people still disagree about this stuff. That's okay. One of the articles that we're going to be reading for this unit is direct is a direct kind of confrontation of these facts about how the more complex a stimulus, the the worse our capacity is for that stimulus class. The simpler a stimulus is, the larger our capacity is for that. That's probably not a surprise though, because I told you that a little bit ago when we were talking about pronunciation time and the word length effect, that words, whenever they are monosyllabic and are short, and, and we can pronounce them quickly, we have a larger capacity for of those compared to more complex syllables, uh, or, or more syllables, I should say. All right, so um, within, within short-term memory, we have the ability to think on different kinds of, uh, of items. I'm going to give you, um, actually, I'm not going to do this right here, but just for the sake of time, I'm not going to, I'm not going to do this. Uh, um, these words right here, moth, supreme, crayon, banner, mantle, calzone, personality, textbook, night, wagging, justice, avast, fracture, stamina, gloves. I'm not going to talk about it here. I'm not going to ask you to remember it, but I might will in a, I might in a future, uh, future units video. Instead, I want to take some time to show you some real examples of this stuff because I feel like there'd be a better learning experience than me just listing off a, a bunch of words to you. I'm going to start here with the O-SPAN task. The O-SPAN task is a is one that usually my classes like doing because it's, it's an interesting task. And uh, if you took cognitive psychology with me and you bought your textbook new, you can actually do this task online. If you, I don't know if you can find this task outside of one of these textbook publishers. I would love it if there was like a video. Maybe I should make a video for this stuff. That's I need to write this down. I need to go on YouTube and like do, because I'm always looking for this kind of thing on the internet and I can never find good resources for it. Anyways, that's a, that's a tangent. So let's talk about the OSPAN task. The OSPAN task, basically what you're going to do is you are looking at a, a math problem. In this case, 15 plus 65 divided by 8 is equal to 10. Is that correct or incorrect? So there you're making a judgment. So this is going to be, this added together is 80, divided by 8 is 10. I'm going to say that's correct. Um, the next thing I'm going to do is then I'm going to see a word and I have to remember what that word is. And then I'm going to be given another math question and then I'm going to be given another word. And then at the end I have to say what the words were. I have to remember what those words were. So um, uh, there we go. 
it's, it's sorry, it's making, uh, here's the practice. All right, so 41 minus one divided by 10 is equal to four. Is that correct or incorrect? I'm looking at this as correct. The word was music. So if you're doing this, you have to remember the word music. Now let's do this next math question. 30 plus 15 divided by six is equal to seven. So this is 45 divided by six. That's not gonna be divisible by six. So that's incorrect. Moon, that's the second word. 69 subtracted by 25 divided by eight is five. That is incorrect. Quarter is the third word. 24 plus four is equal to 30 divided by three is 10, that is correct, bread. All right, so if I were to guess these in order, so which of these was in order? I think, ooh, music, moon. I wasn't paying enough attention, I'm so sorry. Oh, hey. Wait, nope, I got it wrong. <laughs> I got the math right, but I remembered the words in incorrect order. Okay, so I would have gotten that wrong. So the point here and the working memory task here, what it's doing is it's saying like, can you remember this these words while you have other things going on? While you are manipulating things, math, in your in your short term memory, in your mind's eye, so to speak. So that's the O span task. If we want to do another one real quick, 42 minus 6 divided by 6. Uh, so this is 36 by 6. That's correct. Object. 52 subtracted by 20 is um, 32 divided by, that is correct. Bottom. I've already forgotten what the first word was. 17 plus 51 uh, is, that's going to be incorrect, uh, is fight. 29 plus 11 is 40 divided by, that is correct. Manager. 26 plus 16 is 42. That's going to be incorrect. Leader. Yeah, I am I am miserable on this. I am so bad. And part of it is because I'm saying this stuff out loud and I'm being recorded and all this other stuff and I'm tired and it's really early in the morning. Uh, <laughs> um, ooh, I'm going to say fight, bottom, leader, manager. I don't remember object that ever. Maybe we did have an ob I don't know. I gotta have it then. Sorry. Here we go. I got it wrong. It doesn't matter. That, all right, so that's the so that's the whole thing. That's the O span task. That is an example of working memory. Another example of working memory would be the digit span task. And actually, um, I even uh, linked to this in a previous uh, um, uh, class thing. So you've probably already done this one. Um, but you know, if you're trying to remember seven numbers uh, and I do new tests, it's going to tell me one, zero, four, one, two, zero, eight. And then if you're able to recall those in order, that's an example of your working memory or your short term memory, they're the same thing. Um, I would invite you to check out some of these other ones though. Uh, there are, uh, so this one is the end back task. It's really cool. Uh, the attentional blink task is also a short term memory from the 90s. Uh, and this, um, if you go to this website right here, Psych Toolkit, there are a ton of cool cognitive tests uh, that you can find here uh, listed both by alphabetical order, but also um, uh, you can, there's uh, different categories you can find here if you were to like click on some of these other pieces. Um, yeah, so really cool kind of, if you're like me, I remember when I was in college, I was really interested in this stuff and like trying to take these tasks just to kind of see how we study human behavior. Um, but for the sake of, for the sake of time, I'm just going to move on from that. All right. Inside short term memory, we have the ability to think and manipulate those objects. And so this definition is a classic. This is from uh, the 70s chapter by Baddeley and Hitch. We're going to read more about their stuff later this semester. Uh, but they said that uh, short-term memory or working memory is uh, the ability to temporarily store and manipulate information from our environment when it is not directly presented in front of us. So this would include mental math, your ability to do mental math. That is working memory. Your ability to mentally rotate objects is working memory. Your reading comprehension, some problem solving, all of these are working memory. This can be broken down into a couple of different subcomponents though. This means that our short term has a phonological loop for audio, a visual spatial sketch pad for visual information, 
and then a central executive for attention, essentially. And I don't want to talk too much about those things because we'll be talking about those in a later unit. So I'm going to skip this piece for the sake of time. All right. Uh, all right. So let's talk about long-term memory now. So long and don't worry. I promise you that I'm going to come back and talk to these things. I don't want anybody to get too frustrated for me kind of skipping over it because we are going to be talking more about it um, in uh, in in those later for the rest of the semester, pretty much. All right. Uh, okay. And so here's kind of conceptualization of that that we have working memory or slash short term memory. They mean the same thing. Uh, and within that, we have these other kinds of subcomponents. All right, let's talk about long-term memory. So now we are moving over to long-term memory. Long-term memory is the longest lasting uh, form of memory. Some people say that it is potentially limitless. It is an argument that I remember really hating when I was in college. I thought that when my cognitive psych professor explained that long-term memory was permanent and infinite or like limitless infinite I thought like well that's clearly not true because I can't remember what I had for breakfast a month ago but the argument then is that it's not that you lose the long-term memory you've just lost the ability to retrieve that memory and examples of that distinction arise anytime you're like if you've ever watched like a, an episode of television like you're watching the office or parks and recreation or whatever um or, or sorry i don't know what i don't know what the youths are watching these days i don't know y'all watch euphoria is that what y'all watch? i don't know but let's say you're watching a, a, an episode of something and at first you're like i don't remember this episode at all and then about 10 minutes into it you're like okay yes i do i remember this one that's an example where you didn't forget that piece of information from your long-term memory, but you momentarily lost the ability to retrieve it. And with some additional retrieval cues, as the episode progressed and maybe you saw characters that you remembered or dialogue you remembered or a story beat that you remembered, then you started accessing that memory and you did successfully retrieve it. So that's evidence suggesting that perhaps long-term memory is even bigger than we think that it is. Um, so it could, or it does last the longest, and people kind of argue about how, what its capacity is. There's a really fun research article, by the way, um, from a lab actually in Massachusetts at Tufts. Uh, shout out to Dr. Bob Cook, uh, who did a really long experiment on some pigeons and found that their, uh, their memory capacity for long-term memory was somewhere between eight, 1,800 and 3,000 uh, different pieces of information so it's this is really hard to test you know so if you're talking about what you had for breakfast assuming that you didn't eat breakfast 30 minutes ago that would be an example of long-term memory if I asked you to ride a bicycle or to play an instrument that would be long-term memory if you recognize the face of a friend or a celebrity that is long-term memory if I asked you to write something with a pencil or with a pen that is an example of long-term memory. If I asked you to speak a language, any language that you know, whether it be one that you just learned a couple of years ago or one that you always spoke, that is going to be an example of long-term memory. Um, so long-term memory incorporates so many different facets, and this is what makes it so hard to study, is because if I am specifically studying taste aversion, that the findings there may not be identical to what would happen if I was studying you know, well, hold on, that's a bad example because I'm talking about breakfast stuff, so it's talking about food. If I'm talking about taste aversion, that might be a little bit different than if I'm talking about how to ride a bike or uh, how to speak a language, right? So studying this stuff can be difficult and it can also take a really, really long time. There are some memory studies for long-term memory that have been going on for more than five decades where people are like testing people's memory for things that they learned in their 20s and now these people are 70 years old. Um, that would be a fun article for me. I haven't checked out a lot some of those articles in a long time. I would be interested in, in looking to see where that literature is at now. Uh, so if we're breaking down long-term memory, there are other sections of long-term memory, some that we talked about in the very first video, um, about like explicit memory and implicit memory and things like that. We're going to be talking about them throughout the semester, so just to kind of tease your appetite. We have declarative memory, which is like information for, for memories that you that are details that are facts 
uh, that are parts of your knowledge and what you know. So if I say like what your name is, that is part of your declarative memory. If I ask who was the, the first president of the United States, that is declarative memory. If I were to ask you, where do you think you learned who the first president was? Where was that? Where, where and when did you learn that? That is an example of an episodic memory because episodic memory is for any kind of memory for something that has happened to you. Sometimes you hear it called autobiographical memory. So if I asked you, you know, what did you have for breakfast today? That's an example of episodic memory. If I asked you, uh, and you, let's say that you said oatmeal, and then I said, well, what are the ingredients of oatmeal? That would be a declarative memory. So those are actually two separate systems that are maintained by two separate networks in the brain, actually. Um, and then we have non-declarative slash implicit memory, uh, which is memory for things that you can't verbally put into words, you can't verbally recall. So things like playing an instrument or riding a bike or, or, or writing in cursive would be an example of an implicit memory. So just to kind of recap what we learned so far here, which of these systems last the longest? That we're going to say is long-term memory and it's not, a con it's not even a close contest. Long-term memory is going to have the longest. If you were to, if you, somebody asked you which system holds the most, this one is tricky. I would ask for some clarification on that words there because you could say it's long-term memory for this one, but you could also maybe say that it's sensory memory because remember, sensory memory has a huge capacity, but it's very, very short. Which system is the most accurate? You might be surprised to hear the one that's most accurate is sensory memory. The reason why is because, remember I said, like if you're talking with somebody and they were to transform into something else right before your very eyes, that would be an example of a sensory memory. Uh, so you would absolutely notice the difference there. Which system is briefest? That is also going to be sensory memory because that can last about 200 milliseconds. Um, and so thinking about where do we go from here? So we're winding this down. We talked about these three big pieces of memory, sensory memory, short-term memory, long-term memory. Um, where do we go from there? We can, we can continue asking questions such as how long is long-term memory exactly? We're going to look at an article that tries to figure that out. We'll look at the reliability of long-term memory. So when we talk about things like short-term, no, sorry, when we talk about things like false memories, what's going on there? Like what's happening to our long-term memories where they can be distorted or corrupted over time? Um, what makes memories easier to, 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 to falsify, to turn into distorted false memories? What makes memories resistant to that? There may be some things that you'll always remember seemingly in perfect uh, clarity. So why is that? How do things like impacts on the brain, like traumatic brain injury or Alzheimer's, how do those things actually affect long-term memory? Um, and how much of this actually applies to non-human animals? How much of this is specific to human beings and how much of it is actually just a, a basic process for the central nervous system because as uh, you know we're not going to unfortunately we're not going to talk about it too much this semester i could have i would have loved if this class wasn't just memory we could just do a whole class on non-human memory because uh, i would love to geek out on, over that stuff but maybe it's the case that having a central nervous system means that you have the fun you have the ability to create memories and that it's not that our memories are fundamentally different than non-humans, but that they vary in terms of the degree of complexity. So maybe, does a dog have sensory memory, short-term memory, long-term memory? It's just that their capacities are reduced compared to humans? Should I answer that? I want you to think about it. <laughs> All right, so we're gonna be looking at how, uh, how memories are created cell by cell when we talk about neuroplasticity, we're going to be talking about that. We're going to be talking in the next couple of weeks. I say the next two weeks is actually going to be probably three or four weeks uh, where we talk about how learning and conditioning really set the stage for, um, for basic associations and how those basic associations are building blocks that we can form more complex memories on top of. 
and that's that's I feel like I don't know are you inspired do you are you excited to learn more about memory I hope so because I, I tried to make that interesting there at the end but that is the modal model of memory sometimes called the Atkinson and Schifrin model of memory if you have any questions about it let me know I'd be very happy to talk about it with you more uh, and for those of you that tune in towards the end you know I like to have a I like to show you something at the end or that's what I'm, I'm trying to do that now I'm gonna try to show you a cool maybe personal thing about myself um, so that way if you're curious um, you get to know me a little bit more uh, and it's like a little treat a little fun thing here at the end so give me one second I'm actually gonna pause this for a second because I'm gonna show you a video all right thank you for hanging in there uh, the video that I have for us here oops where do you go this is a video that I took in grad school uh, and this is my dog Teddy he is asleep right now because it's late uh, but he's entering in he's more than 10 years old now uh, and he's he's actually an old man he aged very quickly unfortunately um, but uh, this is him as a puppy uh, and this is me I don't think you'll get to see me too much but I just wanted to show you this really cute video of some of the tricks that I taught my dog at this early age and if you don't want to know about this that's fine but if you want to see a cute little dog uh, run around and you get to hear my my wife commenting uh, over the video it's kind of adorable here we go <laughs> You can hear me clicking because I use uh, click, uh, uh, click click training for him, clicker training. I may have cheated a little bit on that one. Wow, my head, I had such a thicker head of hair, oh my gosh. <laughs> he was already kind of coming by the time I said stay, so I feel like that doesn't count. Okay, all right. That was that was maybe too a little too cute. Sorry to expose you to that. Uh, but uh, if you, uh, I was gonna say if you have any questions, I don't think you have any questions about my dog. But if you stay for the unit four video to the very end, um, I will show you what Teddy looks like now. I'll bring him in and hold him up uh, for the screen. He's a little bit of an old man, so I'll have to make sure that I'm recording earlier in the day. Thank you so much for watching. I will see you in the discussion forums. Bye bye.